Hi there, my name's Ilanka Dunin, and this is Monday at Dragon Con, and I was up very late last night, so <laughs> my voice is almost gone. I apologize. Um, so I am a uh, Agile certified Scrum Master product owner, professional, and PMP, which is over on the waterfall side. How many people here use Agile in your companies? All right. How many have received, sorry? There, I, I was going to get to that. I was going to get to that. How many have received actual Agile training? Are you certified? Yeah. Certified. Um, S a Scrum Master, product owner, trainer? Scrum Master. Scrum Master. And you? Not certified. Okay. Um, so, okay. So that was how many people use Agile in your companies. How many have companies that use Waterfall? Right. How many, you don't know what the heck you're using? Okay. <laughs> How many ha are in companies that are supposedly agile and you think it's nowhere close? <laughs> okay. Um, so that's a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about, about what uh, agile actually is. And um, if anyone wants, if, if this is a relatively small group, so if anybody wants to participate in the discussion, feel free. Uh, so very quickly, uh, waterfall versus agile, for those who don't know. Waterfall is a step-by-step -step system, which is a perfectly valid method for some very large projects. Um, agile is a more, sometimes it's just called iter iterative development. It's not even called agile, which is basically you do a little piece and then you show it to the stakeholders. Is this what you want? No. Okay. And then you go back and you do another little piece and another little piece. So it's what's called an iterative system as opposed to Waterfall's incremental system. Waterfall, again, is perfectly valid. Like if you're building an airport, you don't want to use Agile because you need to know where's the airport going to be, which way are the runway is going to point. You need to get all your licenses, things. And you don't want to be halfway through building the airport and someone's Eh, can you make the, the runway point in a slightly different direction? No, you, you've, you've already kind of got things laid out. Ditto with building a very large building. You, you know where all the, the girders are going to be and you know what materials you're going to be. You don't want to be up to the 30th floor. And so I said, can we make the, the windows a little rounder? Because that change would just ripple through everything else. It, it's not possible. But with software, especially, you can definitely have an iterative system. So with Waterfall, there's certifications. Uh, the main uh, uh, in agency there is called the Project Management Institute. And the main uh, certification there is a PMP. It's a very well-respected certification. If you are a project manager and you ever want to be looking for work, PMP is the most requested certification. Um, now, of course, there are you know issues with project management. You, many of you have probably seen this uh, cartoon with people, you know, what marketing specified and what the, the salesman promised and, and the design group's initial design and then finally at the bottom, you know, what, what the customer actually wanted was just a tire hanging from a tree. So uh, project management is always kind of an art and, and um, kind of getting all the different requests from all the different departments and kind of balancing them all. All, all those departments are considered stakeholders and then trying to balance them all. So uh, also just kind of uh, going over the difference between incremental and iterative. So if you were, do this is a very famous image in the Agile community about if you were doing the Mona Lisa and you were doing it incrementally in a waterfall style, you'd be building it step by step by step by step to get the, the full picture. Whereas if you're doing it in an iterative system, you kind of figure out, okay, what do I want to do? And then you just kind of sketch it and then you sketch it some more. And, and the advantage to that is if you, as a project manager, as a company, if you run out of time or out of money and you just need to ship you have something that's at least partially there. You don't need to wait for the full thing to be there. Because with Waterfall, you can still have projects that are years overdue and millions of dollars over budget because they're doing it incremental piece by piece. But an advantage of, of Agile is, is you can get you know pretty good, ship it, and then go on to the next thing. So Agile means a lot of different things. It can mean Scrum. It can mean Kanban. It can mean XP. It can mean feature-driven development. It can mean test-driven development. Crystal, where there's all kinds of different colors of, of analyzing a, a different company. Um, so 
here in this talk, mostly I'm going to be fo focusing on Scrum and Kanban, and I'll kind of touch on some of the others a little bit. The, the basic elements of Agile, also sometimes it's called lean development, is you want to create value very rapidly, and you want to adapt to change. That's one of the core elements. And you want to make what's called an MVP, which is a minimum viable product. So that Mona Lisa, you have it sketched out. OK, you've got a minimum viable product there. Um, a little bit more about the different uh, types, Scrum, between the difference between Scrum and Kanban and XP. So XP is mainly for software. You want co-located teams, and they're really focusing on quality. So that's where you might have like paired programming, and, and you can be working XP, and the priorities can kind of shift. Scrum, you generally have a small cross-functional team, and they're working in these short time boxes, which are called sprints, generally two weeks, two to four weeks. They have a product owner who, at the beginning of the sprint, sets the priorities of what the product owner wants. The product owner is talking to everybody else in the company. And then the team says, OK, we can commit to some subset of those top priority things. And then they, they do. They work in the sprint. They get to the end of it, and then they show it to the product owner and say, hey, is this what you want? And then there's discussion that goes back and forth. Normally, at that time, the stakeholders usually have more requests that they want to toss into the mix. So then the product owner, again, reprioritizes. Kanban, sometimes you can work in those time boxes, but, but not always. More it's a case, and I'll show you more slides on this. It's a case of you've got work flowing through like a, a Toyota car production process. And so uh, Kanban means card. And the Japanese came up with it that as something was going through, someone would just work on, on a certain piece. And they'd have these what's called whip limits, work in process. And then when they were ready for the next thing, they'd hold up a card. And then the next bit would come through. So Scrum is named after the rugby really, when people all get together and they're passing the ball together back and forth. The, in, in terms of project management, it started coming in to the fore in the 1980s, late 1980s. That's when papers started being written about it. And, and there's, again, lots of different ways of describing Scrum and Agile. But the core element is continuous innovation. You're doing it incrementally. You're doing it spirally. And in the early 90s is when a bunch of guys got together at a resort and they said, OK, we're going to make the Agile Manifesto, which I'll show you. And then there was an actual a certification organization called the Scrum Alliance, which was created in 2002. So the Agile Manifesto, at least the version that's used for game development, it can be used really for any kind of software. There are four key things, which is one, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Working game or working software over design documentation. Stakeholder collaboration over a fixed scope, schedule, and budgets. And responding to change over following a plan. So any company that calls itself agile should be adhering to these four elements in the manifesto. Now, green ones on the right are also valued, but the ones on the left are valued more. Any questions? Um, feel free to raise your hand. Um, so training, the, there is the Scrum Alliance, which is a certification body. Another one is IC Agile, which has this sort of pedal system. There's seven different certification tracks. Uh, in my experience, Scrum Alliance is much better known. Uh, th and there's others. There's scrum.org. But the most recognized one is Scrum Alliance. So that's where you can become a certified Scrum master, product owner, Scrum professional, agile coach, enterprise coach. And th there's other certifications coming up. Right. So uh, other core elements. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Sure, sure. So when you talk about, like, if you were trying to start this in your company, mm -hmm. Good question. So the question was, if someone were going to start using Agile or Scrum in their company, would they need all of these? And, and, and the answer is no. The, the main thing I would recommend if you were wanting to start Agile in your company is to, I mean, you can do it by just reading up about it. But I would recommend that you send at least one person in the company to become a certified Scrum master. And with that, and empowering them, management has to be behind it, um, and then have them start trying to change things. The first things are going to be figuring out who the stakeholders are, key, uh, 
seeing if you can make some cross-functional teams, and that's usually a big challenge because often there's fiefdoms. You know, the, the programmers have got this thing, and, and then the IT has got this thing, and the artists have got their whatever the, the company is, and they say, no, I, I don't want to let this person go because then I won't have control over them. Um, so it's, it's a long process that we just kind of leaning into it and changing it. A large company that's trying to go agile, even with the support of senior management, it can take years to really get into the groove of things. Uh, and um, partially because of politics and partially because it's a very different system. You have these small cross-functional teams that are like, give me work, give me work, give me work. And you have a product owner saying, okay, I've got I've got this list, and usually it's presented as a list of post-its, and they've got them prioritized, and the product owner says, okay, I've got these 25 lists in the team. If, if it's a what's called a mature, agile team, we'll look at that list and say, okay, we can do you know, A, B, and G in the next two weeks. And then the product owner will say, no, I really, really want C. And so the team will go, okay, well, how about B, C, and H, and I? And, and so there's a negotiation that goes back and forth in what's called the sprint planning meeting. And then once the team is committed to their, so the, the big list of everything is called the product backlog. And then the team commits to something that's called a sprint backlog. And they move those post-its over to a, a sprint backlog column. And then management goes hands off and the team goes into a self-organization mode where they figure, okay, we've got these four or five post-its. How are we going to get them done, done in two weeks? And a key element of Agile is let the team figure it out that when you have these command and control systems and you're telling people do this, do this, do that, it is less efficient than having a team that just figures it out on their own. On their own. And the military has done a lot of research on this about how to get things done quickly in the field, how to react quickly and it's far more efficient to let the people on the ground figure out what they're doing rather than have some general say well okay you go here and you go here and you go here um that, does that answer your question okay okay um so one of the things that helps with that is the product owner when they're setting up their product backlog is they need to have very clear definition of done so instead of just um you know we need the wall painted right that can mean a lot of different things. It, it could mean, you know, paint it all the way to the edge. It could mean do all the trim. So it, it's up to the product owner to say, okay, what are my acceptance criteria? How do I know when the team is done? And the team may ask, okay, you want it painted. Does that mean two layers? Does that mean three layers? And, and you get this negotiation back and forth, and then the team will know specifically what they have to have done by, by the end of that sprint, two weeks or four weeks. Or in the case of software, um, you know, in, instead of just, oh, I don't know, create a module. You know, did it just, Microsoft is, is now grabbing control of my computer. I apologize. No, no, go away, go away. We back? I'm back. There we go. Okay. Um, so instead of just create a module, um, define what that module is supposed to do. And sometimes you'll also have what's called test-driven development, meaning the tests to show that the module is done are written before the assignment of the module. So as the team's working on it, they'll code it and they go, "Is it? did it pass the test? If it passed the test, they know it's done. If it didn't pass the test, they keep going. And there's these tools, which I'll get into later, such as Jira, um, which can actually have some of these tests coded into the card. So um, I know someone in the government who works on a big, big project. There's 10,000 different programmers, and they're all in one big JIRA project. And so a programmer will be ready. He'll grab a card, a task, a work item, and he'll just start coding. And he codes, did it pass the test? No. Code, code, code. Did it pass the test? No. Code, code, code. Did it pass the test? Yes. Card goes over. He grabs another card. So he's just constantly flowing through these things. Um, now, a, a story is, is a way of describing one of these things from the product owner. This is a classic way of doing it. It doesn't always have to be that way, but it is, which is, as a blank, I want blank, so that business value. So with painting the wall, it would be, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. as a track director, I want uh, the wall painted white so that we can project onto it. It's... it's um, Product owners can do this. Any stakeholder in an agile system can also write a story. And having that so that business value will then help the product owner prioritize these stories in the product backlog. 
Um, and then there's also things about story points, which is how long something's going to take or how difficult something is. Uh, I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds on that, but if you can have stories where you put a size on them, and often it doesn't have to be points, it can just be a t-shirt size, saying, okay, this ta you have small, medium, large, extra large. We have 25 post-its over here. Let's organize them by how difficult they are. You know, we have super easy, uh, not so easy, super hard. And we know this one's gonna take twice as much effort as that one. And, and then you take the smallest one and you say, okay, this is an extra small t-shirt. And then you take something that's twice the size of that and that's like a small t-shirt and then twice as medium t-shirt. And then you know when the team takes stories on that they, can, they know that it, typically, again, a mature team will know that they can handle three larges and two smalls over the course of a sprint. Now you have a velocity. You know how much work that team can do, and that helps when you have that big product backlog and you know you've got 200 larges and 20 smalls. There's no way it's gonna get done in two weeks. You can ask that it be done in two weeks. It's not gonna happen. And this is a tool for management to know about how much work their teams can handle and estimate how long it's gonna to take to get a certain thing done. Sorry, talking a lot on one slide, but. <laughs> okay, um, so this is, ah, question, go ahead. Do we have the box? No, yep, okay. Are, uh, are physical cards and post-it notes and, and sheets of paper, is that your typical uh, way of reporting the, the workload? Is that pretty? Okay, so, so the question was, do physical cards and pieces of paper, are, are those the typical way? Um, many companies use post-its. Even huge companies just use post-its. It's very easy to understand. It's easy to move things up and down the board. And you can have, say, the senior management has one room where they're doing the big features for a particular client. And then a team will come in and they'll take you know, one of those features and they'll take it into their room and they'll post it and then they'll do a bunch of other smaller post-its that kind of shred it into smaller pieces. You can also have, um, instead of one, cross func one cross-functional team, you can do what's called scaled agile, where you've got 25 cross-functional teams, each of whom has a product owner. Those product owners go into what's called a scrum of scrums, where they're prioritizing there, and then there might be like scrum of scrum of scrums, and, and it, it can scale and go up. And often post-its work perfectly well, but there's also lots of tool sets, Jira, Trello, Plan.io, some use Google Spreadsheets, um, a Pivotal Tracker, LeanKit, Kanban. So I, I'll be talking a little bit about some of those, but when you're learning it, just use Post-its. Perfectly valid. Thank you. Yeah. Any question? Okay. So uh, I'll go a little bit more into this, but this is the basic flow of, of a sprint. As I was saying, there's a product backlog at the far left. The, uh, the product owner's working on that. Um, and they compile all the things that are coming in, not just from themselves, but from all the different stakeholders that are, that are saying, can, I make, can we make the button green? Um, you know, can, can, we, can we make it so this works on an iPhone? All these things are showing up in the product backlog. And then the product owner, their job is interfacing with the rest of the team and prioritizing this product backlog. <clears throat> then there'll be a sprint planning meeting where the team will d have a negotiation with the product owner and come up with a sprint backlog of what they think they can do in one sprint. This sprint will be two to four weeks long. During that sprint, every day, the team will meet, usually in the morning, and they'll have a time-boxed 15-minute meeting where they all share information about what they're doing. Three questions. What did you work on yesterday? What are you going to work on today? Are you blocked on anything? and they can have this really fast meeting. If that am I blocked turns into a larger meeting, they can meet later on in the day and say, okay, we need to take this offline. But that 15-minute meeting, 15 15-minute meeting needs to be very short. The scrum master runs it, enforces that it's short, and then the team can scatter and go back to the different things they're working on. At the end of the sprint, they've got their, uh, what they've done, which should be a PSI, a potentially shippable increment, an MVP. It may not be something that's going to ship, but it should be enough that potentially it could ship. That way you're doing sprint after sprint. And again, if time runs out, if money runs out, you can say, well, we've got something that can ship. It's not that piece of the Mona Lisa, it's a sketch of the Mona Lisa. Questions? So this is just a, another way of drawing it. it. Anywhere you go that talks about Agile is going to show this cycle, that you've got the um, 
the product backlog. You go into sprint planning, it turns into a sprint backlog where you've got the stories, so they break those down into tasks. They have their daily scrum meetings. Then another meeting is story time, which might be all of the different stories and requests that have come in from the different stakeholders. That's a time when everybody can sit down and prioritize. So it's not just they're throwing their story into the mix and saying, okay, prioritize. They may want once a week, um, some product owners will do that. They'll have like a meeting every Tuesday, 2 p.m. is story time. And that's when all the stakeholders can go and pitch, please, 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 can you prioritize mine higher on the list? Uh, then at the, at the end of the sprint, there's a sprint review where the team shows off what they've done. And, and the product owner can give thumbs up, thumbs down on things. And, and then you uh, <clears throat> go through it. I'll skip the retrospective for the moment. You go into the, the next sprint planning on the beginning of the next cycle. The retrospective is something that doesn't need to happen every sprint, but it should happen often. This is a time for the team to get together and talk not about what they're doing but how they're doing it it's their opportunity it's a space for them to say how can we improve how are we communicating well do we hate that this guy's chewing gum all the time um is uh, is the is the room too warm uh is it um we're having a lot of trouble communicating with the people in india it's it's anything they want to talk about to see how they can work together better as a team go through that i don't know the the tuckman model which is forming storming norming performing and then in uh, agile you have this thing called swarming where the team will swarm uh, the different stories that come in but anything in agile any meeting in the company that is a recurring meeting whether it be with the cross-functional teams whether it be the managers meeting on a regular basis any type of meeting should periodically have a retrospective where people can talk how can we do better um, this is just a, another kind of way of describing the different things. So the roles in Scrum, you have a product owner who does the prioritization, the Scrum master who manages the process, and you have the team that does the work. There can be some overlap. The main rule is that the product owner and the Scrum master should never be the same person because often there'll be, there's going to be conflict or, or pressure from one side or another. Product owner interfaces with the rest of the company and prioritizes in the Scrum master guards the process and protects the team from the rest of the company. They're looking for any impediments that are preventing the team from getting their work done and then going through and trying to clear those impediments. The, the ceremonies or the meetings of Scrum, we have the sprint planning, sprint review, the retrospective, and the daily Scrum. And then what's called the artifacts, which is the, the product backlog, the sprint backlog. And then some people also use burn down charts where you can actually track the status of a sprint. So. That's Scrum. Now we got Kanban. Uh, Toyota was the one that invented this with, with raising the card. And it's the idea of a card moving through columns that have work in progress, whip limits. And the main thing is they want to eliminate waste. So imagine that a, you got pieces of a card that are going through the, uh, the assembly line. And if someone says, stop, okay, so you have these cards, but you also got these big pieces that are all through the assembly line. So Toyota was trying to come up with a system where you can move it through and you don't end up with all those pieces which are, are waste. That's, that's a, a financial issue. So this is a sample Kanban board. So again, the, the cards are moving from left to right and each column has a whip limit, a work and process limit. So anybody that's in that department, they know that they're only going to be doing a maximum of those, say, an analysis, four things. It's also very important that it's a pull system. It's not a push system. So even if in the backlog they've got tons more things that they can push into analysis, analysis says, no, we have four things we're going to work on, then when something moves from analysis to development, if it's not overflowing the development whip limit, then analysis will pull in something from the backlog. Um, there's, a, there's some wonderful exercises that I could do if we had more time, kind of workshops making things with paper airplanes. But it has been proven time and time again that this is an efficient way of, of people working. Uh, a lot of it has to do with context switching. So uh, you know, pretty much everyone multitasks to some degree, but there's a limit to how many things you can multitask on at once. Uh, with a programmer, they kind of they can get into the zone, which is where they should be, and they're coding. And you go in and you ask them a question like, "Can you take this other task on?" Boom, they've snapped out of the zone. It's going to take them a couple hours 
20 minutes maybe to get back into that zone. So you want to limit the amount of context switching that they have to do. I see nodding. People know when you're coding, it's like, leave me the F alone. <laughs> I'm in the zone. I'm in the zone. Okay. So XP uh, isn't so much cards moving back and forth. It's, it's a way to improve the quality of software. So if anyone here has ever done paired programming where you got two people working on something, you do visualize the work and you get into these short cycles. But this is more where you're doing the test-driven development, the, the uh, in continuous integration. It doesn't have these, the roles, the product owner, the scrum master in those. So the basic element of any agile is, is going to be the post it's moving across. You got to do, you got doing, you got done product backlog to sprint backlog what are we doing the tasks what's in process and what's done and a lot of companies will will use the post-its the question was over there about will they use it yeah to do doing done some of them have really big boards um, with a lot of post-its some of them are doing them in different iterations but it's perfectly valid it's very efficient and agile however many people look at them and go there should be an app for that. <laughs> There's software that can definitely do these things. And the software can, can track these things. Software also can give management a much better picture about where things are um, and help them to plan better for on really big projects. So there's tons of different tool sets. Um, Google Spreadsheets, perfectly valid. Probably the most commonly used one in very large companies is Jira. Um, uh, Pivotal Tracker is one, Plan.io, Trello. I like Trello, some people hate Trello. There's tons, TFS, Rally, version one, a bunch that I haven't even mentioned. Has anyone here used a tool set that I don't have on the board? No? So. Azure, okay. Any other agile system? How many people here use Jira in your companies? Okay. Um, Pivotal Tracker, LeanKit, Trello. Okay, I'm I'm a big Trello fan. Um, so, so talking a little bit about Jira, super powerful. Uh, it does have a bit of a learning curve if if you're just getting yeah <laughs> if you're just installing it it needs to be installed on servers needs a ton of configuration but once it gets there it can it can really keep the teams cooking um, and it's generally done uh, in in pair with another thing called Confluence which is effectively a wiki that so you'll often hear people not talk about just Jira but Jira and Confluence um, so Jira sort of looks like this you can you can set things up you can set up the different stories you can set up swim lanes it does have this board that sort of looks like the post-it board but has more information on it um, but again it takes a lot of configuration to get it going but it's it's a it's a good system right pivotal tracker another one you can set it up similarly and you can also have post-its that are kind of moving across the uh, pivotal tracker uh, one of the things that as a game developer that I like is having something where you can actually put pictures on the cards so you can say here's the status of the orc or or here's the status of, of the creature that we created and and pivotal tracker and Jira are, are a little light on that. Trello is pretty good. You can put pictures on, on Trello cards. Um, I like Trello a lot. It's free, very easy to learn. I could have anyone here using Trello in about 10 minutes. Um, and it also has lots of plugins. Uh, so if you're using Slack, uh, you can have Slack integration. So if you want to make a new card on Trello, you can just type a line in, in Slack and boom, it'll create a card on your Trello board. All right. Okay. Um, lots of yeah, the, I can't say which is the best system for any particular company. It depends how much you're going to pay, how big a project, how many people have you got, how much time do you want to spend configuring it, do you want something that's smartphone capable. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I'm not going to say, here, use this one. Um, I was going, if I have a internet here, I was going to do a quick Trello demo. Let's see. Can you see? You are, you are seeing my web browser. I am not. Okay, because it's... Aha! Okay, so I'm not a Mac person. How do I mirror the screen on a Mac?
project. I, I, I'm going to create a brand new board and I'll show you how easy this is. So we'll call it Dragon Con. Okay. All right. And then I'm going to create some lists to do, doing, done. Close that. And then I'm going to add a card like Pack for Dragon Con. Um, uh, buh, 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 create costume. What are other tasks you do when you're getting ready for Dragon Con? Create costumes. What? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Hotel. Hotel. All right. Give me a couple others. Hmm? I, I can't hear him. Plan your costumes. Oh, okay. Plan costume. Okay. Hmm? Oh, plane reservations. Okay. Coordinate with friends? Oh, put, put pets in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Babies. Okay. Kennel. Okay. Okay. So you have these in to do, and in there you can add, say, a checklist. Um, for creating a costume, which might be, um, you know, buy materials, sew them together, um, uh, try it on, uh, fix it, <laughs> you know. And so, with this, so create costume. So let's say we we packed, we finished packing, um, and then costume. We're now working on the costume in there. We're checking these different things we fixed it we go okay it's done right and then you can move that over into done so this is a very simple way of moving the post-its in an agile system you can make it much more complicated um, I could have a system where I'm adding other people so I could add everyone in this room to it and then I could like say okay well this person's working on this card and this person's working on this card so you know who's working on any particular card we could set the velocity for different things you can see what are the most recent changes in Trello. So, so this is just super, super simple. Jira is like this on steroids. Um, and um, anyway, that's that's the basic flow of an agile system. How long would you keep something in Dust? Hmm? How long would you keep something in Dust? In Dust? Good question. At the end of the sprint, generally the product owner would review these things, and then we would have an archive list and say, okay, this has been accepted by the product owner and it would be taken over to the archived and then I could archive this and um, archive this list. Boom. And now it's completely gone out of there. See? And in, in Jira, you have costume releases. Talk, talk. So in, in Jira, talk into a microphone. Yeah. Okay. Right. In Jira, there's a concept of releases. So anything in the done lane, when when you're in there, you can click a release button, and it does the archiving there. But then it also makes a release tag for you in the application to do further right. work with down the line. So you can set. We've got these 17 releases that are coming up, and so you know when something is actually ready to ship. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, so if you want to learn more about um, Agile, there's a bunch of good websites out there. Uh, Mountain Goat Software is a great one. Mike Cohen, he does a, a regular blog. Uh, if you want, if you're ever a scrum master and you want to learn techniques for how to get the team engaged, like for doing retrospectives, tastycupcakes.org has a lot of good ideas. Um, and I mentioned Scrum Alliance. And if we had more time, I would play you this wonderful video called Agile Product Ownership in a Nutshell, which is all kind of hand-drawn art. It's really pretty. Um, there's some great books. Um, the classic is this one, Agile Software Development with Scrum, with the red, yellow, green, blue. Uh, Chris Sims wrote a book called Scrum, A Breathtakingly Brief and Agile Introduction. Uh, Lean Startup is good for any company owner to read. Uh, and if you're in the game industry, the classic book by Clinton Keith is Agile Game Development with Scrum. So. Um, that's it for me. Any questions? Oh, yes. Okay. We'll start with you. Do uh, you have the, the box? Okay. 
Will we have the PowerPoint available on the website? Yep, I can. We, I'll do that. I'll be sending it to one of these fine gentlemen, and they will post it. <laughs> EFF.dragoncon.org. Um, with all this parallelism, where people are developing in, during the um, the sprint. Does this feed back into, is there a, an agile program structure that works best, or where do we find out where, how people organize their programs so they can have n number of people working on it? You mean between using Scrum or Kanban or, or XP? Well, no. I mean, when, you're, when you've got the team and you've assigned tasks and they're all going off working together uh -huh. on the same system mm -hmm. is there a place to learn about how to structure the program the programs to make that kind of parallelism to make to allow them to work in parallel without tripping on each other okay B great question dependencies dependencies okay. are killer so you've got say six different teams and and one team cannot do task X unless the other team does their task Q. Is, is that what you're asking about? Yeah. Um, it is a huge issue. Um, and with JIRA and many of these others, there's ways of tagging which things are blocking other things. And that's something that often the scrum masters will have to get in there. Or when you have multiple teams and you have that scrum of scrums where you have the product owner and the scrum master of each team meeting in their own separate meeting and that's where they're discussing these dependencies about what needs to be done first so that it doesn't block another team great question i should have covered that okay yes as you go from scrum to scrum if you're always making everything you planned um does that mean that your team is kind of taking a very conservative estimate so that they don't get anybody upset so that they kind of underestimate it so that everything looks good give management the illusion of control <laughs> while they're ta while they're busy taking it easy uh, each week. It, it's a great question and often what usually happens is teams overcommit they say that they can do more than than they really can and then at the end of the sprint you find out that they had okay eight stories and they got two done and five others are, are your six others are partially done that's the most common problem yeah, if, if, they, if they overestimate and then management goes bad shit crazy on them <laughs> maybe they decide they need to just keep everything right. so that management's happy even though they're not as productive as they could be. it's it's an interesting phenomenon that when you give the team control so they're self-organizing they usually become um very very good about it because everybody's kind of watching each other and and they know as a team i guess th there's probably some teams that say okay we can do four stories but let's only do two because that way management won't come down on us but uh, even in that case what would usually happen is they do those two but then they'd spend the rest of the time working on what's called technical debt they'd be refactoring code they'd be fixing some other bugs that showed up um so the scrum master then would would see okay there's an impediment which is that the team is afraid of taking on too much work so then the scrum master would probably work with management and say hey if you want your teams to be more efficient you know give them more space but it, it, it's a valid question but usually it's the opposite usually they overcommit. so a lot of this a lot of this stuff is based on uh, around testing uh, that's the that's the end goal is to do something and then test it and then once that's passed that's mm -hmm that's you're done so with something that has like numerical inputs and outputs that's a pretty easy thing to figure out but a lot of the stuff is is graphical and like user oriented so what does that look like when people uh, need to do testing for something that interacts with a human right um, you know is it end up being like a rule book that somebody has to sit there and follow and say like mm -hmm. it does all this stuff or is it is it uh, automated or how, how, how what does that often look like right right so so you've got something where y you really need some uh, focus group 
testing or, or seeing is this what was expected. So you can structure it many different ways. Um, one way is if you do have kind of that set rule book of what's going to be tested. Often what happens is you'll have one person on the team in the task will do the task and then someone else on the team who didn't do it will then test what was done. Sometimes the team will just be tasked of get it to the point of being testable and then it gets passed off to another team that is then going to, or another department of the company that's then going to be putting it in front of the customers to see it is, is it does it make sense are you clicking on the right things are you having to think too much as as you're going through the GUI does that answer your question yeah it, it's it's interesting because the the framework is like is design test design test and it makes it th seem like a very it makes it sound like a very rigid process, but in reality, it's it's a very fluid. It sounds like a, a much more fluid process than than what you kind of see on a bullet pointed list of how everything works. Yeah, I mean, QA is, is essential to the process, and QA. This would be in the retrospective. I mean, have QA speak up and say, uh, I think you know we need to allow more time in the process for this kind of testing, or maybe QA isn't even in the Scrum structure. The Scrum structure is for creating the software, testing the software to make sure you got the basic functionality, and then it goes to a QA department that's not in Scrum, not in Agile. They just got to do their thing and, and get with people to make sure that everything's working. Does that? Yeah, a company doesn't have to be all Scrum or all Kanban or, or all anything. Some companies will have some Scrum teams and some Kanban teams and some that are just kind of their own thing in different parts of the company. Um, back to the commitment in say sprint meetings mm -hmm. and when that w say that sprint is ending and there's extra work available mm -hmm. that product owner will usually just say go to support or some other and say what do we need to prioritize what can we still get done with this time in mm -hmm. that sprint right so if there is an under commitment that time still gets used mm -hmm. they just have to go back and figure out really quickly what's Mm -hmm. What's left to prioritize? What needs to get? What can we fit into the very end of this? Right. That that's an answering his question. Yes, uh, the product owner can always, uh, you know, have that prioritized list, and the team can always pull some additional things out of it. There's also the issue. So often with a, a new company that's doing it, you'll have a team where there's a, a coder on it who's not completely devoted to that one team. They're they're having to do a bunch of other things around the company as well because they're the only person who knows how it works. And so there's things where you can kind of figure it out how much time they're able to devote to that team. And if, uh, say, a bug comes up, um, you know, the website stops working. You can't go to the product owner and say, okay, the website stopped working, and the product owner says, okay, I'll add it to the product backlog, and, <laughs> and we'll see about doing it in the next sprint. No, it's got to be done right then. And so th there's ways of kind of allowing time for those emergencies. Yes. Okay. Um, with becoming a CSM, how much does it cost, and how long does it take to get the certification typically? Good question. Um, there's tons of different training agencies out there. In general, like here in Atlanta, I could probably look around, you search on, on Certified Scrum Master course. Ballpark, it's gonna be about $2,000 for a two to three day course, and you'll come out as a Certified Scrum Master. Ditto for product owner. Um, if there's a big company, I would recommend hiring a, a trainer to just come in and speak at the company, and then you'll have a whole bunch of certified people at the end of it. So if you have a game development company, the guy is Clinton Keith, and he'll come out and he'll spend two, three days in the company. He'll, he'll train people how to be certified. He'll also talk with the managers. And again, I have to emphasize, if a company's switching to Agile, the managers have to be on board. If the managers aren't on board, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Okay. Uh, how do you decide how much is going to be in each sprint? And is, are those thing, do those things have to be related? How much is going to be in each sprint and? How much is, and how much do they need to be related? Like if you have a whole lot of little things that need to be mm -hmm. done, mm -hmm. but they're not really related, right? mm -hmm. would you split those up into different sprints or would you, is it more based on priority? Oh, okay, good question. It's entirely up to the product owner. The product owner owns the prioritization of the backlog. And the, so the product owner, he or she might put up saying, okay, we're going to do five of the red things and two of the blue things. But again, it's up to the team to say how much they can put in the sprint backlog. It's very much a pull system. The product owner doesn't say, you're going to do 
red one, two, three, four, five, and blue one and two. The product owner says, these are the top things on my list. And then the team can go in and say, okay, well, we think we can do red five and blue, you know, all five of the reds, two of the blues, and we think we can do more. And then the product owner can bring more to them. So it's it's entirely up to the product. They're going to have so many stakeholders coming at them. Marketing's going to want this. Uh, senior management's going to want that. The customers are going to want this. And so that's that's the product owner's sphere is figuring that out. It's not easy. Any other questions? I, I have one in the front. Yeah, keep going. What if you have a really, really, really small team? Okay. And the product owner actually is a scrum master too. <laughs> okay, really small team mm -hmm. and someone's doubling as both product owner and scrum master. I've seen it done. What's the question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how can you, yeah, how, how can the, 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 the thing that happens is uh, how does the person that's in charge, what, what if that person also has to do some development or should that person tell the higher ups that person cannot do development anymore? Um, it depends what, uh, I've seen people who have done it all. You know, you have a team of three, four people and they're, they're kind of passing back and forth the jobs of product owner and scrum master saying, okay, you be product owner this week, you be product owner this week. If it works for them and they're churning out software, okay. The, there's, there's nothing in the rule book that says thou shalt not be both product owner and scrum master. It's discouraged, but if you have a super small team. I do um, game jams where we get together and we make games in 48 hours. I use Trello. Um, we put together a team that forms within about 20 minutes on a Friday. Um, and um, when I'm on these teams, the first things I do is I set up, okay, we're going we're gonna to be on Trello. We're going to figure it out and then just start putting tasks in there. So I'm sort of being a product owner and a scrum master and, and, peop and prioritizing things. And then the team is kind of working on things and we have some sort of MVP in 48 hours. So it's doable. Um, you, you just got to be quick. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Great, great, great questions. Great questions.